Hi, I'm Selena, and I'm with um, Annie's Bookstop of Worcester, and I'm here with Lisa Tuttle, who is a fantasy, horror, and science fiction author. And uh, for those uh, who uh, are not familiar with your work, how would you describe what you write? Uh, well, I, I've written quite a number of different types of things. I mean, right. I, I'm probably best known. <laughs> I, I think, I mean, I would have to say it's always in the fantastic area, yes. you know, of, yes. of the genre, the fantasy, science fiction, horror, ghost stories, weird stories, strange stories. Um, my last two novels are actually in a series uh, that are detective stories set in the 1890s, but with um, supernatural or fantastical elements. And I mm. sort of, so I try to make them quite realistic, historically accurate, but then they have you know, inexplicable things that happen. Um, and then my most recent book is a short story collection called The Dead Hours of Night, which has right. just been nominated for the Stoker Award. Um, and that came out, that was, that's a kind of, I guess, career spanning collection. Cause I just kind of went through uh, old stories, new stories, fairly recent, earlier ones picking out ones that I thought were maybe my best. Um, so I, I don't know if that answers the question, but I've also written uh, my first book. I certainly thought it was a collaboration with George R.R. R. Martin called Windhaven. And we thought of it as a science fiction novel at the time, but I think these days it would be seen more as fantasy because although it's set on another world and there's nothing, um, there's nothing fantastical or supernatural about it, uh, but the the feel of it is is kind of you know they're on it's a, a planet with a lighter gravity than Earth and so they're they're and societies to you know uh, they crash landed from Earth many generations before and have developed their own society with a guild of flyers who travel about from island to island. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so <laughs> okay. And I've written now, for children. Yeah. Right. Sorry. Right. Yes. It's the time now, lag. Sorry. <laughs> now, um, your your picture goes in and out a little bit sometimes. I think it's going to continue that. But uh, can you tell people why that might be? Where are you located? Yes, that's uh, I'm in Scotland and uh, we all, we don't have very good Internet connection. Not that everyone in Scotland is is plagued in this way, but where we live, uh, we can't get super fast broadband. And uh, whenever I've done Zoom meetings, very often I get a little signal or a little notice that comes up that says your uh, internet connection is unstable. So I'm afraid that's, I just hope it doesn't cut out completely. But usually, I mean, at one point I was in a group meeting and they said, oh, just kill the video and we'll just talk. <laughs> but I don't know if that's appropriate in the, because then it's sort of only just going on the, you know, the one, uh, channel or whatever so hopefully that won't happen here <laughs> but i yeah. just wanted to warn warn people that it might go mm -hmm. you might have a small box and then a large box um which just happened oh, is that what's happening? oh yeah. i see <laughs> so um so what can readers expect um from uh, the dead hours of the night you said it was it was uh yeah. several short stories yeah it's uh i think it's a dozen stories uh, different lengths. Uh, they're all they're all pretty dark, or or nearly all of them are dark. I guess they're uh, some are you know ghost stories, horror stories, psychological horror, supernatural horror. Um, so it, it it wouldn't necessarily be for everyone, but if you like horror stories, strange stories, ghost stories, then then that would be uh, then yeah. I'd recommend it. And um, do you what was the inspiration for all of these stories? Or, or uh, <laughs> I know well, it's hard to say. I've been each one's different. It, it is. I've I've been writing. I've been attracted to supernatural and strange and ghost stories since I was a child. Really, I mean that I, that was. I think that was probably the first grown-up literature I ever read was short stories in collections. You know, like great ghost stories of the world and great tales of terror and and that sort of thing. And uh, so they were the, uh, but when I was writing them, um, 
when I began to write and began to sell, uh, I, I, there weren't as many markets. Horror wasn't such a recognized genre. So I tended to, um, most of my stories went to something like the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, because if they weren't, I was, I wrote some science fiction stories, but I guess the majority were, you know, strange events, um, uh, things, you know, kind of inexplicable happenings. And uh, uh, I, it's just still how my mind seems to work, I guess. And so that's what, and each individual story, um, I mean, I gave a little, I, I did a little introduction to each story where I just said either something about where the idea came from um, or, you know, how it was received. A few of them have been turned into um, uh, TV episodes of old anthology series that are probably still floating around on the internet. So, <laughs> like Twilight Zone type of type of uh, yeah, shows. Yeah, it was. Um, yeah, it was never the Twilight Zone, but there was one called uh, uh, the Hitchhiker. Uh, this would have been, I guess, in the eighties. And oh, there were a couple of Canadian series. I can't remember the the names. It was something like you know, Monsters might have been one of them. <laughs> uh, I, I actually now can't even remember the name of the series. They were never very um, mainstream, I guess. I think The Hitchhiker was the most, you know, on a proper network, uh, ran for more than one year, you know. So. Uh, okay. Um, did you have to do any kind of research for your, for your stories at all? Research? Uh, hmm. I do like doing research, but um, it would only be, you know, if I needed to find out something, usually I would, I would kind of, they were either in a setting where, that I knew, um, or, you know, they'd be set somewhere. Uh, sometimes I even kind of borrowed other people's houses you know, to put my characters in, uh, or they'd be based on places I'd lived. And, uh, you know, so they would be set, they might be set in London, or they might be set somewhere in Texas, which is where I grew up. Uh, or uh, even, uh, I don't know. I mean, sometimes they were, they're, they're real. And, and, and most often the main character would be uh, a woman, probably a youngish woman, um, at least when I was younger. Uh, and often they were stories, of, they've been stories about either relationships that go wrong, badly wrong, or just something terrible enters someone's life. I mean, in one story, which won uh, the horror, I think it was the HWA award, uh, uh, is called Closet Dreams. And it's actually about a girl who's abducted and locked in a closet. Um, I think that's sort of my most horrible story <laughs> I've written because um, it's sort of based on, you know, it's the sort of thing that does happen does. Um, as opposed to, a story called Born Dead, which is, which that was inspired by, by the phrase Born Dead, which is kind of awful. And it, it seems impossible. You know, it's one of those birth is about life. Uh, but in this case, it was about the idea that someone was born dead, but nevertheless went on growing and kind of, you know, so it's a kind of neither alive nor dead. I don't know. It's just it's just a kind of how you can't explore an idea like that in in mainstream fiction. So it's a kind of natural, I guess. For mm -hmm. yeah. are are more of your stories short stories than novels? Yes, I I, I mean I have written a number of novels. Um, yeah. I think I think maybe maybe twelve novels overall, um, but. I, I seem certainly in the past couple of years, I've mainly been writing short stories. And at the beginning of my career, uh, you know, it was probably, gosh, well, I started writing or write, I mean, trying to sell stories, you know, kind of seriously in high school. And so it was probably a good 10 years before I wrote a novel. Um, but in all that time, I was writing short stories. And I mean, when I am writing a novel, I don't tend to write a short story you know, because I'm sort of involved in, in a long work. But, um, but I, I don't know, I, I, I have spent a lot of my time, my writing time, writing shorter works. Okay. Um, what else can we expect from you in the near future? 
Well, I've just put together a new short story collection. Um, uh, what's the title of that one? Oh yes, Riding the Nightmare, because my very first short story collection was called uh, A Nest of Nightmares. Um, and that was reissued a couple of, a few years ago by Valancourt, who've also published um, uh, Dead Hours of Night. And he, the, the publisher asked me if I had enough stories for another collection. And I said, oh yes, yes I do, as a matter of fact. So again, it's a kind of mixture of uh, older stories that had appeared in early uh, collections of mine that are out of print um, and previously uncollected stories that may have appeared in you know, one anthology or a, a magazine. Um, so it's a, a similar, yeah, so it'll be a similar thing. And then I've also have written the third in my uh, Jesperson and Lane mystery series. Uh, and that's, mm, well, I think that won't be out until next year. Well, actually probably both of these books will be out next year. So 2023. Um, but anyway, that's one I'm just waiting for the, um, uh, for my editor to come back with me with some notes because she said, oh, I did want you to uh, still do a bit of work on it. Fine, fine. So I'm just waiting. <laughs> so it's kind of, I'm in that kind of suspended state, you know, waiting to hear back from publishers. But um, both of the books have been, you know, they're intending to publish them. I just don't have a date at the moment. And the Jesperson and Lane novel is called The Curious Affair of the Missing Mummies. So it's Yay. my mummy novel. <laughs> Wow, that sounds great. <laughs> and it, 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 it takes place uh, partly in the British Museum and partly in the Highlands of Scotland. So, uh -huh. your your uh, definite close locations. <laughs> yes, yes, places I have definitely been. In yes. fact, I'm going to grab. I meant to get it. Hang on one second. Yes. I meant to have it on my desk so I could just hold it up, but that's The Dead Hours of Night. That's my most recent publication. So, Great. Um, okay, hmm. now I have some questions about being a I writer. Should have, I should have arranged books all around me. <laughs> sorry, sorry, that's I talked okay. over you, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's okay. So what is your favorite part of being a writer on the whole writing and publishing process? I was thinking about this the other day because um, I knew you might ask me something like this. Um, and I, there are two, two things I like the best. One is when I get an idea, or rather it isn't just like a vague idea, but it's where something I've been thinking about comes together with something else I've been thinking about or I've made notes of. And I suddenly see it's like the story or the novel, whichever it is, opening up, expanding. You know, it's like, oh, oh. That, that's a good idea. Yes, I want to write that. That's one part. Of course, that's, that involves no work. <laughs> that's like magic. My other favorite part is after I've written at least a draft of whatever it is, a short story or a novel, but it's not, it's not quite right. It's not really quite finished, but I've actually managed to get the whole, some form of it down, you know, on, well, I would have said in the old days, I would have said on paper. Now I'd say, you know, on screen. And I start rewriting it. I start reworking it. I read it through. I read, find things I don't like. And I change them. And I get the feeling that I'm really making a difference. And, I'm, and it's, it's, it's getting there. So I do, I enjoy the rewriting process much, much more than the, the hard slog of the first draft. I like, I actually like rewriting. Mm. So that's a, a lot of uh, authors have told me that, that that they really love the uh, the editing and the rewriting more than more than yeah. just doing the first draft. Yeah, yeah. because it it yeah. kind it's, of yeah <laughs> yeah. It's it's strange because I've 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 known people though who hate rewriting and who, who and who don't like it if if for example they've given it to an editor to read or to a friend even to read. And they make a comment and it's like, oh, it's going to be so much hard work to go back and change it. But even though, and, and of course, sometimes that's not the first draft. Anyway, that might be after they they think they've got it finished. But even then, even if my heart sinks slightly, like it's time to move on, it's like, no, that would improve it. Yes, I do need to expand this or 
cut this bit or change this bit, you know, it's, it's, I like that part. Yes, I like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what do you consider the most challenging part of the writing process on the whole writing and, and publishing process? Most challenging part. Well, if you're going to, uh, if, it, if you're opening it up to uh, publishing, <laughs> I guess it's getting sold. It's, you know, right. waiting, waiting to hear or uh, being told it's not what they're looking for or whatever. I mean, that's horrible. Um, the other, but I guess the other challenging thing is, is to just kind of keep at something, you know, that, mm -hmm. I mean, in almost every novel that I've written, it, it doesn't happen so much with short stories, which is probably why I like them better to write in almost every novel I reach a point where I'm thinking this isn't this isn't working this is I shouldn't have started it uh or I'm not ready to write it or something where I get really discouraged and so it's very difficult then because sometimes too you don't I, I don't know if I should kind of force myself to keep going. Usually I go for a long walk and think about it and give myself a little bit of time off, you know, to wait and see. But there is that, there is still that problem of, have I made a terrible mistake? Should I just forget this, shelve this one? And because I usually have some other ideas, you know, waiting and go on to something else or do it. And if I press on, am I going to just make things worse? You know, so that that's difficult is, is sort of, making those decisions, you know, about, about a, an unfinished work, I guess. Mm -hmm. So what's been your favorite adventure during your writing career? Adventure? <laughs> I don't know. You mean in writing or? No, just in your adventure period, your, your favorite adventure that you've had. Gosh. I don't know, really. That's a, it's an interesting question. But looking over my whole life, <laughs> I don't know. I have done things, of course, which is. <laughs> um, What's the favorite thing that's happened to you in your writing thing. career? Gosh, mm. I don't know. I, I mean, there were there are people I've met that that was wonderful, you know, and friendships I've made, and mm -hmm. and travel, and and the, just the whole fact of. I think also just coming to live in Britain was was pretty okay. Big. That's I mean, yeah. <laughs> how did this that happen? Was, how did you how did you decide that you were going to live in Britain? Well, let's see. I first I always wanted to visit uh, the UK, and I had made plans with a friend that we were going to come over in 1976. I was working for a newspaper, and so was she. Then she. Her husband, her husband got into med school and they had to leave. So she had to leave her job. And, and it was like, well, you know, she was going to have to get a new job so she couldn't take a vacation. So I just ended up going on my own. And I decided just after having two weeks traveling around uh, in England and Scotland, I just thought, oh, I have to come back here. So my next time that I went was for the World Science Fiction Convention in mm -hmm. 1979. And there I met someone uh, who, who was my, who I ended up marrying, Christopher Priest, a writer. Um, right. that, was, that was actually the reason I moved to Britain in the first place. But our marriage was not a big success and we did split up. Uh, and I later happily married someone else who was also British. So I, I stayed here and, you know, I now I have British citizenship. And uh, in fact, I've been living in Scotland uh, with my husband and daughter. We moved up here mm, 31 years ago. So I'm more British than American now. <laughs> okay, that's great. So what is the greatest lesson that you've learned thus far in your writing career? Hmm. Well, I think the big thing is I mean, people often say, oh, I'd love to be a writer or I'd love to do what you do. And the, the, the basic lesson is, well, you just have to do it. You know, it's it's like, I mean, I wish I'd written, you know, 10 more books that I have never gotten around to writing. But I can't blame anybody else for that. And it's, you know, life gets in the way sometimes or, you know, particular. I sometimes feel, you know, I didn't spend enough time on certain things. But 
I always wanted to be a writer. I've always written. I can barely remember a time in my life when I didn't. But the important thing isn't thinking about it or even making notes about it or reading about it or taking classes or going to writers conferences or conventions. All those things are fun, but the only thing that matters really is actually writing and finishing what you write. I remember that was a, oh, back, back in the day, you know, back in the seventies, someone had some, there was a sort of list. I can't remember who the writer was who came up with, it may even have been Robert Heinlein. It may have been several different writers, but they had these lists of what you had to do to be a writer. And the first one was, you must write. The second yes. one was, you must finish what you write. So that's even more important because I have endless, ever since, I mean, I, can, I can't even tell you how many times I've sat down and started something, whether it was in a notebook, whether it was on a typewriter, whether it was on a computer, and they're just bits and pieces, you know, they, they never were finished. So it only counts if you finish it, wh whatever it is, whether it's a poem, a short story, a novel, a trilogy, anything. But then, and then the third thing is, if you want to be a published writer, well, you, then you have to send your stuff out. I mean, nowadays we have, there are more options for people to be self-published writers. So, uh, so, you know, so, so it isn't just, but you have to do something. In other words, once you've written, started writing, and once you've finished something, and once you are, have got it as good as you can possibly get it, then you have to let it go and release it into the world. However you do that, whether it's spending a lot of time trying to find an agent, whether it's giving up on finding an agent and just trying to find a publisher, whether it's giving up on finding a publisher and deciding to do it yourself, but to do it properly, you know, have it edited, do, do whatever it is you have to do. But uh, anyway, that's the great mm -hmm. lesson, I think. Okay, so that's basically the, the advice that you would give to other writers, really. Absolutely. Anyone who said, I want to be a writer, I'd say, well, then are you writing is the first question. Are you writing? Is because I mean, I could say, oh, man, I'd love to be a concert pianist. Do I play the piano? Well, no. <laughs> so and it doesn't even mean you have to go to, uh, you know, get a degree in writing or or even go to a creative writing class. Some people find that very useful. Some people don't or join a writer's group. But whatever it is, the writing is the first important thing. Right. Yeah. So are there any clubs or groups or other organizations that um, you would recommend to other writers that might have helped you in your career? Well, I, I did go to Clarion when it was first. I went to like about the third one, I think. And, and mm -hmm. then I went again, which was kind of naughty. Of me. I don't think you really need to go twice, <laughs> but I had enjoyed it so much because that was just that really was pretty transformative. And it wasn't just the, the published writers and editors who, who, you know, gave, but it was getting intelligent, informed feedback on what I was writing. It was also the company of other people who were writing and, and it was just being made to write, you know, you, there you are in that place for six weeks. You'd be, it, you know, if you're not writing, you're wasting your time. And so that also, that really, um, yeah, that was great. And subsequently I've been, you know, in writers groups, informal, kind of things and um and 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 that's helpful too just to get kind of feedback and it and, and encouragement in a way being around other people who take writing seriously and people who read and think about stories so that's that's very helpful yeah mm -hmm. great now i have some questions about you as a person what is one thing that most people don't realize about you uh, well <laughs> I don't know, because I don't know what people think about me, but a, a funny thing happened when I, I interviewed uh, Joyce Carol Oates um, recently uh, wow. on, on, the, on, on, on a Zoom thing. Uh, but before that, I met her two, two years before at the, or not, well, however many years it is now, I lose track with the pandemic. But there was a ghost story festival in Dublin. And... Uh, I was invited as a guest. She was the kind of main guest of honor and I was invited to interview her in public, you know, in front of the audience. So anyway, when I met her, I, what I wanted to tell her was she'd always been a great kind of icon for me, a literary icon. And one reason was, was when I went to Syracuse University, I had the same, my advisor had been her advisor. 
you know, in the English department. So I told her this, that I'd been at Syracuse and she went, you went to Syracuse? And she said, she had imagined me, she'd read my stories and she we'd been in anthologies together and all this. So she knew who I was, which was also pretty great. But she said, I imagined you as being like, I don't know, like Daphne du Maurier. I thought you probably lived in a castle in Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if anybody imagines that I live in a romantic castle <laughs> and she said and then she turned to, to to someone else and said can you believe it she went to Syracuse <laughs> so, that's funny I I will be actually be interviewing her um on, oh. at the end of the month oh well tell her hello from me <laughs> I will definitely now that I know you've met her Yes, I will definitely yes. do that. Yeah. But, uh, no, that, that was just a question. I, I I was thinking, how would I answer this? Because I don't know what people think of me. And you never do know what people think of you, really. But that was so funny that Joyce Carol Oates, who was, and also I thought of her as this incredibly unreachable, cool, intellectual, brilliant writer. And, didn't know that she would, you know, that we could just be laughing together and, you know, that she was interested in so many different things. And of course, back in that day, back in the early 70s, she was a literary figure, you know, and yes. the, the other writers, the writers I'd met, and, and I was writing science fiction and fantasy, you know, so I thought, well, oh, that'd be just way out of her uh, sphere of interest. And then to discover that she, she liked horror stories and yes. she would actually edit and thought and write her own uh, some of them really pretty horrific <laughs> yes <laughs> incredible <laughs> so what is or are your passions uh when you're not writing and how do you make time for your non-writing hobbies and things that you love right well one thing i love actually and i've got more and more into it with the internet <laughs> is i've always liked doing research and I got into doing family research, family history. And from there, it's like, it doesn't have to be my family. I'm just interested in finding out about the lives of people. Even sometimes I just run across something in an old newspaper and I'm reading about this person and I'm wanting to know more about them or the author of some forgotten book. So I love kind of investigating these, these kind of lost lives, you know, these forgotten people. Um, so that's sort of a habit. I keep thinking, oh, I must do something with this. You know, I must turn it into something and, and sell it. But so far I haven't, well, I did one, write one article about, about one, one writer, but mainly uh, it's just kind of research. And I just kind of fill up notebooks and, you know, pile them up. Um, yeah, that, and plus I love reading. You know, I, mm -hmm. I read very widely too, and I want to keep reading widely because, at the moment, I'm um, I'm reviewing the science fiction, fantasy, and horror for uh, the Guardian newspaper, uh -huh. and so that's once a month. But it means I get sent, you know, stacks of books, and and I always read more than I can review because uh, because there's only space for like about well six maximum. So I was told between four and six books, you know, a month to a roundup. Tiny little reviews. You can't give them proper. But I gotta read them, think about them. And somehow I find myself, oh, I've read nothing but books that are coming out this year in this field. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I have to make time and go, no, I'm going to now read, you know, a, some classic I've never read, or I'm going to read a mystery story, or you know, a new novel from Joyce Carol Oates, or you know, whatever it is. <laughs> uh, so that's that's the other thing. I remember um Larry McMurtry, uh, when he he kind of, I don't know. I can't remember how long before his death, but at some point he said he was not going to write another book because it took up too much of his reading time and he didn't have very many more years left. And he had there were still so many books he wanted to read. And I oh, I identify with that greatly. I'll never be able to read all, all the books that even all the books I own, because I can't mm -hmm. stop acquiring them. I can think all of us are like that. Yes, yes. Keep buying more and more books. <laughs> I know, I know. Even when I swear, no, I'm just going to get rid of them now. Pass them along. Yeah. No, I just keep them 
<laughs> so what does your writing space look like? Um, and what do you need to have around you when you're writing or editing? Well, what I'm, I'm sitting at it right at this very moment. <laughs> it's usually just this laptop in front of me. And it's on a big, it's on a very long table that I actually had made. I mean, it wasn't specifically designed for me, but I was living in London. My first marriage had broken up. I needed to get a few more pieces of furniture, uh, including a, a dining table. And I thought I would love to give dinner parties. You know, now I'm a single woman and I need to invite my friends around. So I, there was some place that was advertising that they made tables to your specifications. So I got this lovely table. But when we moved to Scotland, we don't have a big enough, we don't have a dining room. And we don't have the, the flat I'd been living in in London had a just was a big long room. And so it had plenty of room for a big table. Um, so we couldn't, it wouldn't go anywhere. So I just had to take its legs off. We, we brought it up the stairs. I thought, well, I'll just have it as my desk. So it has no drawers in it, but it has lots of room for books to pile up on either side and piles of notebooks. Uh, and the only thing, uh, I mean, and I'm, what it is, is it's a, a, a loft conversion, you know, it would have been an attic and it's been turned into two uh, offices really. Well, it was before we bought it, I think it was two teenage boys' bedrooms. <laughs> but um, so it's up at the top of the house, which is just a one story house really, except for this. Um, so I've got a lot of books, um, pictures on the wall. And the only thing I really have to have is I have to have either a notebook or a notepad or a pile of paper and some pens and pencils so that while I'm typing or if I suddenly think of something, I always need, to, <laughs> I don't know, I've never got into this habit of opening up another window and making a note. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, if I'm looking things up on the internet, I still, for me, the easiest thing to do is to write it down and, you know, to copy things down that way and keeping books beside me or whatever, if there's anything I need to refer to. Uh, and then usually I have something to drink. I mean, at the moment, well, it's now cold, but this is my, it's just a cup of tea. <laughs> so in the morning, I usually have a cup of coffee. In the afternoon, I have a cup of tea. Uh, other times I might just have a glass of water. Uh -huh. And uh, do you have anything to eat with you at all? Or or do you just save that for the kitchen? <gasps> I Well, I do sometimes bring up something, but I, I always feel terribly guilty about it. And I also know, well, you must get crumbs on your laptop, you know, on the keyboard. <laughs> That's very bad. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I try and keep it away from the computer. And when you're writing, do you prefer music or silence? And if music, what kind? Yeah, I I don't, I, I can't multitask, you know? I can't do two things at once. And if there's music, I will be listening to it. If I'm somewhere else, or if there's music in the background somewhere, like, I, I don't mind. It's, but if it's got, if it's a, if it's a song and I can hear the words, it, that's too intrusive. Um, so, I mean, if there's music on, I'll just kind of tune it out. Uh, I don't listen to it. Well, it was, I have to admit, there were times when I was younger, I can remember finishing my, it was, well, it was my second novel, but it was my first novel that wasn't a collaboration. Uh, it was a horror novel called Familiar Spirit. And I was getting to the end and it was going to be a real, and I was living alone at the time. I was in Austin and I put on some music. I don't know why, I just needed and I remember it was, um, but I couldn't play, again, it wasn't songs. It was, it always had to be music without words, but it was the soundtrack from, there was a, a movie called Sorcerer. Um, I can't remember who the composer of the soundtrack was, but anyway, I just had it on. It was very driving kind of music. And uh, it just got me in the right mood to write this, you know, kind of climax <laughs> on my typewriter. So, so yep. I can see the point of having, but it just would have to be just right, I guess, mm -hmm. just the right uh, emotional tone. Yeah. Right, right. Um, writers often have furry, feathered, or otherwise non-human companions to help them um, with their work. Uh, do you have any of those and do they help or hinder you? Oh, you mean, you mean like, do you mean something like this? 
<laughs> or live ones. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, you were talking about live things. This just sits on my on my dictionary for some reason. Um, <laughs> no, I, I have a dog. We have a dog, family dog. He's um, his name is Ben, and he's a Cavalier King Charles oh. Spaniel, and uh, and he's. Yes, yes, I, I do like having a dog. <laughs> Does he help you? But he Does doesn't he help. help. <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> uh, then he hinders you. <laughs> oh, well, he would if he was, I mean, he doesn't, he isn't allowed to come up in my office because I know what uh, he really does. He goes and sticks his head into the, into the rubbish bin, you know, into the wastebasket to see if there's anything he can steal or he wanders around to see if there's anything he can steal. So, um, so he's really not allowed to come up here. Uh, and if I'm downstairs, if I try to write downstairs, which I've occasionally done, oh, I'll go sit on the kitchen table and type because I don't know, there's noise or whatever. He then wants to climb up into my lap, which is, that would make it impossible. He's a rather large, I mean, he's rather large for a lap dog, but uh, <laughs> okay. he does like to sit on me so, uh -huh. so that's not very helpful <laughs> <laughs> okay i just have two more questions uh oh you're breaking up now oh uh okay. okay just just two more questions um one is where can people yeah, no, find my, your... the internet connection is unstable oh okay where, um, where can people find your work um aside from annie's book stop of worcester and um we can get your books <laughs> and people can call us at 508-796-5613 or you can email us at orders at annie's books worcester.com and we can get or try and get most of your books um and where else can people find your books uh, well, I hope most, uh, certainly the ones from Valancourt, you can order online. Um, you can get them from bookshops. Uh, this, the latest collection that came out both in hardcover, paperback, and ebook. And my, um, some of my older titles are mainly available still as ebooks, or you find secondhand copies, I guess. Okay. And my last question is, how can we follow your work and share your awesomeness? <laughs> That's very kind. Um, I don't actually have a website. I keep thinking I must, but uh, I, did I did get one set up at one point. And then I don't know what I did, but I somehow managed to delete the whole thing. So, <laughs> so but it was just as well, because it was about five years out of date, so it's probably just as well. I was trying to update it, but it didn't work. Um, but I am on Facebook. I do have an author page on uh, Facebook. So I think it's just, I think, what is it, Lisa Tuttle author? I think that's probably what it is. But if people, I mean, there are other people named Lisa Tuttle on Facebook, but I do have an author page. So, um, so that's probably the, and I don't go on Twitter because, or Instagram don't. or any of those things, right? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> okay. It's just Facebook. One, one's enough. One social media platform is enough for me. <laughs> I don't blame you. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much for uh, for being with me today. Really enjoyed speaking with you. And oh, uh, I enjoyed it. <laughs> and good luck with the uh, with the dead hours at night. Thank you. And uh, and with your the rest of your books that are that are going to be coming out. <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay. Thank okay, you. Thanks. Thanks, Lisa Tuttle. Bye. Thank you.